Uh, good morning. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon in New Zealand. Uh, dear our invited guests, uh, Ms. Margaret Lewiston, dear heads of department and public health faculty, Sriwijaya University, lecturers and students who are joining this agenda, representatives from BEM, IKAGI, HIMKESMA, and HMKL, public health faculty, Sriwijaya University. Thank you to each and every one of you uh, for being here today at this guest lecture with topic participatory action research. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here for me uh, to speak on behalf of the Dean, Faculty uh, of Public Health, Sriwijaya University. Uh, in today's guest lecture, uh, the agenda is to focus on participatory action research applying gender analysis, right? Uh, it is related to sexual harassment and women's rights. As we know that sexual harassment uh, is a violation of women's human rights and a prohibited form of violence against women in many countries. So it is uh, any unwanted or unwelcome sexual behavior. The most effective weapon against sexual harassment, I think is prevention. Uh, these students, uh, Ms. Margaret Leniston is an expert in her field and will deliver lecture content clearly and concisely, I think. And I, and I highly recommend you to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, we hope uh, this virtual guest lecture can inspire and bring uh, students attention on how to generally conduct uh, participatory action research. I think uh, that's all for me and thank you very much for all. Thank you, Graceva. Thank you, Mrs. Maripaini for your amazing opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, before we enter to the main agenda, there is a form that you must answer. To the operator, please send a link in chat Zoom. We gave you five minutes to fill it. Um, di sini kami memberikan waktu lima menit untuk teman-teman mengisi form. Form terdiri dari empat pertanyaan kepada seluruh audiens dipersilakan untuk mengisi form yang telah disediakan. Hi, you do.
Okay, form closed. Well, thank you for, uh, for our audience for your nice answer. And here I will tell you the information. We are holding a challenge to make a snap journal. And you write what you get in our discussion today to limit for uploading Snapgram challenge until the end of this event. We will announce the winner on Instagram, Phil underscore Unsri. Baik, di sini kami ada challenge untuk kalian, yaitu membuat Snapgram yang isinya adalah materi apa yang kalian dapat pada diskusi kita hari ini. Dan jangan lupa untuk tag Phil underscore Unsri. Batas penguploadan Snapgram sampai acara selesai, dan pemenang akan kami umumkan di Instagram, Phil underscore Unsri. Ladies and gentlemen, here we enter to the main agenda. On this occasion, we will broaden our horizon about women's rights and sexual harassment. With our speaker today, he, she is Mama Garlaniston and be moderated by Ms. Jovita. First, I will read the CV from our moderator today. Her name is Jovita Okta Melinda, nutrition undergrad student of Sriwijaya University. She is a vice president of Student Executive Board, Public Health Faculty, Sriwijaya University. Besides that, Jovita has achieved many achievements in various competitions, and she has also participated in various interns. To the Honorable Jovita Okta Melinda, time is yours. All right. Am I audible? Hello? Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Gracefa. All right, thank you so much for the opportunity. First of all, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. But first of all, honorable mention, uh, Ma'am Asmari Paini, SSEMKS, as our Vice Dean of Public Health Faculty, Sriwijaya University. And also honorable mention, Ma'am Najma, as KM MPH PhD, as our directing lecturer for this international lecture today. And also honorable mention, Ms. Amon, that will be sharing about New Zealand scholarship and also international student experience in the last sessions. Okay, brothers and sisters, I'm Jokita Okta Medinda, and I would be moderator for this international lecture today. All right, so our topic today is that participatory action research applying gender analysis, including women's rights and sexual harassment. And as we know that we already have a very amazing speaker today. She is Ma'am Margaret Laniston. She has lots of working experience. Some of them are as a policy advisor, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Women's Affairs and consultant for Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And also she is also gender advisor, Pacific Islands Forum, Forum Secretariat and Regional Agencies gender policies and sexual harassment and workplace policies. And she is also a gender and social development advisor to NDP on human rights. And also she is education executive for New Zealand Workers Education ASSN and vice president of New Zealand Community Education Association. Wow, what an amazing working experience, right? But before that, let me say hello first to Ma'am Margaret. Hello, Ma'am. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Tere uh, makasi. Um, salamat pagi uh, from New Zealand. Uh, salamat um, siang. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Uh, welcome to you all. All right. Selamat pagi, ma'am. Uh, um, and yeah. I really appreciate this opportunity. And this is just the beginning. Uh, we will open a dialogue for the future. Thank you. All right. Salam alaikum to you all. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am Margaret, for being able to be our lecturer today. And also, we are so grateful for having you here. And we are so excited to learn more from you about the topic today. And welcome to Public Health Faculty, Sriwijaya University. All right, so Ma'am Margaret today will share about participatory action research, applying gender analysis, including women's rights and also sexual harassment. Maybe some of us are familiar, Ma'am, about participatory action research. So today we need to know more about, about it from you and also what is actually part, uh, participatory action research and also what is the importance of intersectionality 
and also maybe what is gender and also gender analysis uh gender analysis and framework and its framework yeah, ma'am and also gender workplace and sexual harassment policies uh, maybe uh, ma'am margaret will explain us about it so if you guys have some question letter you can write it on your on uh on chat box or maybe you can raise hand so you can speak directly to ask ma'am margaret about the topic itself okay maybe without further ado uh, I will give time and space for Ma Margaret to give lecture to us. Thank you. Thank you, Ma Margaret. Time is yours. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jovita, and uh, thank you for the, the great speeches uh, to welcome us here, all of us together. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I hope Najma, you're well and um, you're available here. I hope you um, thank you. It's very exciting to know that I have two scholars um, whom I've uh, supported in various ways in New Zealand while they've been on a New Zealand scholarship. So that's very, very exciting. So thank you for this opportunity. Now, the topic is very deep, but I've tried to make it simple because of time and we've cut into time. I do need to know how long um, you want me to talk for and I'll try and move around my slides so I compact what I've done. Um, Jovita, can you explain to me how much time would you like? Because I've got some exercises right. for the students to do uh, so that we're right. interactive. So if you can give me a time frame, because Emon's also there, um, we can. Um, I will adapt. All right. You have 19, 90 minutes to lecture, ma'am. And 15, yep. minute, 15 minutes to question and answer session. Yes, I know that's that's um, that's almost going to keep up the whole time. How much is time are you, is Iman wanting to spend with the students? Uh, well, it's like only five minutes. Yeah, five minutes five until ten minutes. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, the people can put the, the as, as Jovita has said, any questions, put them in the, in, the, in, the, in the chat. I will be keeping an eye on them. I may not interrupt immediately, but I will go back and reflect. And if there's anything outstanding at the end, we've got time, we'll open it up for questions. If I can't get through all the answers of the questions that you have, then I will actually carry on and answer them after the lecture so that I will try and um, you know, be fair to you all. Um, now I'm going to share my screen over to my uh, um, PowerPoint and take you through on time. Now, what my, pen, my anticipation is that I will, uh, as Javita has already explained, um, I have come here with 30 years of experience, and a lot of it is in Indonesia, I think about four years in Indonesia from 1996 to 2000, which was a very volatile time for Indonesia. And during that time, I had the opportunity of traveling right throughout the Eastern Islands and um, uh, Sulawesi, I didn't get up to Kalimantan, but Sulawesi, um, Timor-Leste, West Timor, Sumba, Sumbawa, Sumbawa, not Sumba, and also over to, yes, I said Flores, Lombok, and so on. And so I have been involved with a number of projects, which I will try and use as an illustration. So I will be stopping my slides and talking about stories. So I want it to be very practical. I have a master's in international relations and development, but this is what I'm sharing with you today is practical experience. Now, the sexual harassment side, in terms of gender policies, I will talk towards the end. And I will only do uh, most of the, we can pick up that later and do more work on um, probably policies. But I've tried to fill out uh, this opportunity by giving you lots of um, references in case you want to develop your own policies within your own universities but I'll talk a little bit about that but that's towards the end once we've finished the gender intersectionality and the um, disjection research. Now Najma uh, you know came with a number of questions as I imagine Iman did too what is petition 
participatory action research. End of her master, her PhD, she had to start thinking about intersectionality and trying to find out where it would, how it would fit in. Um, and she also needed to understand the theoretical perspectives on gender um, and gender analysis. So um, she, uh, I, I spent some time trying to explain the framework because when any of you do research, it's very important that you understand that you are going to have to analyze the information and what you observe. to analyze it. That's why I'm going to be able to give you an example of how we go through and do gender analysis and give you stories about how, hopefully that will explain it in more detail. And then you can pick up the references and some of the videos and you will be able to see more for yourself. So hopefully that will be helpful. Now, have you got the screen shared with my PowerPoint yet? Am I on? You have the PowerPoint now? Um, now? Yes, we have. Do you have the? Great. All right. So uh, we want this uh, um, experience to, to be inclusive and to actually to make sure that you actually still are able to, um, uh, to participate. So we want it to be interactive and we will have discussion and participation and engagement. All participatory uh, action research is about interactive learning, learning with this, the people who you learn with them. But it is also important that when you're learning, you're analyzing and feeding back. You are reflecting, you are acting, you are adjusting your work, and then you reflect back again take further action and reflect. It's a theory of reflexive action. It's called praxis. And it's by Pablo Ferrere, who in 1968 wrote a very important text called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I've given you the reference for you to look It in more detail, but engagement with very active negotiated learning between the researcher and the researched. It is a method of social investigating problems. You will have a research question, and it might be about health, or it might be about geothermal energy, or it may be about um, sexual harassment, or it may be about child health. Um, but it must involve the people whom you are investigating or the issue you're doing will determine how you go about doing that. For example, one of my students was working on child rights. And so she had a very challenging ethical uh, question about how does she, how does she, um, protect the rights of the children, as well as ensuring that she can, is able to glean the information and interpret it. So sometimes they're very complex and other times with Najma's work on HIV, she was negotiating in different situations, which she had to accommodate for them to communicate to her. She can talk to you more about that. So it's a method, participatory action research. It is a method of social investigating problems and it involves the participation of those that you are working with who have a problem that they're willing to share or they have information or knowledge that they wish to share with you. As I said, it's a learning, it's an education process with the, between the researcher and the participant. That's where the word action comes. Them. You participate in search, which requires you to analyze the causes of the problems you're addressing and some collective discussion about the problems and interaction. You're not doing secondary research where you just go and look at statistics and report. No, you're actually engaged in a relationship with the participants. 
So finally, it is also a way of researchers and those who are oppressed joining together and sharing their experience. In the case of Najma, when there was They were able to write, raise each other's consciousness and talk about how they could advocate for improvement. And that was all part of the learning process. In fact, I remember saying to Menajma, maybe your success factors, some of the success factors of you analyzing your methods of participatory action research might be to ask the women what action have they taken as a result of being engaged and participating? That if they have made a change or learnt more information and they have advocated to improve their relationship with their doctor and ask more questions or to remove themselves from a situation of abuse or taken some action because they've been in the research process, then that would be a success factor. And it would mean that they were learning to determine and control their actions as a result of being learning ways of act. Acting out because of their their, um, their engagement in the research. So that's why it's participatory and active and it is intended to have uh, an outcome that will improve uh, uh, the situation that they have found themselves in. And that person I've mentioned is a person called Maguire. He's written about this. Now, this um, participatory action research, it builds on methods um, that integrate well with gender and feminist perspectives because gender research, which will try and improve the situation for women and sometimes men, but it will particularly attempt to, uh, to um, uh, achieve more gender equality and improve and empower the women to take action. So it's very compatible um, with the process of, uh, of um, participatory action research. And therefore, we often refer to feminist participatory action research or gendered participatory action that if you, uh, um, if you are um, not, uh, including uh, an analysis of the structure and situation and the political and, and, and the, um, the empowering environment um, through a gender analysis, then you, you, if you don't do that, you won't be able to make the changes towards gender equality. So it's an essential part of the process. So they, the, and I, Now, reason why I say that is that we stood through gender participatory action research in challenging entrenched or unjust power relationships between men and women or between society yeah. and women. Hello? Can you hear me all? Javita? Yes. Everything yes, going yes. all going okay? Okay. Yes, so, we can, but um, sometimes. But sometimes you lose your connection, ma'am. Oh, I see. I'm not sure why that will be. Yeah. Your connection unstable. Uh, is unstable. Is it? it? It does. Is it saying it's unstable? I can't see any. Yes, because I, I when it, when you were playing the introductions, I also had it breaking off sometimes too. Hmm. Well. Um, I can't see any evidence of why it should be breaking up. Um, hopefully, if I talk slowly enough, you won't miss too much. And also, um, you have the slides that I'm talking to. Yeah, maybe the committee could... So if it becomes... 
the the draft presentations of me margaret to chat box so absolutely yes you can yeah absolutely have they got it now are they seeing it i'm sharing it yeah you could share it ma'am it is shared yeah it, yeah it's already clear ma'am yeah good yeah. okay so i will carry on all right I'll just see if there's any. Um, so we are just to recap. Uh, we're looking at challenging entrenched unjust power relationships. So I'm needing to go um, uh, on now. Um, now, what is the feminist participatory action research? What are the principles that are really important to, um, to consider? First of all, we're looking at I won't read it in full because of time, but you can go back and read it. I'll just highlight the yellow bits that the purpose is to look at structural change to try and improve the difference between men and women. Hello, somebody talking? Yeah. Javita, is somebody talking? Yes, ma'am, but we already unmute her. Uh, but already we, uh, mute her, ma'am. We carry on? Yeah, okay. you can continue. Okay, thank you. And the second principle is that you actually in, increase the voice of women. So the, uh, that their voice, that they are the experts of their knowledge. And Najma will tell you that, that the women themselves have the experience with her research and they know what their relationship is like, different from the person beside them. They will be the ones that will uh, be wanting to have a voice to try and improve their situation. And it's very important to create opportunities with your research to have policy dialogue. That is that the outcome of the research is designed to, to improve the situation. And an example being with all of my research, I have always tried to make sure whether in my thesis or in work uh, or for the women in Tanzania, they all were able to take the information that was analyzed alongside with them and they were able to take it to conferences internationally or they were able to sit around the table at the Forum Island Secretariat or they were able to take their voice to APEC in Mexico or to uh, Philippines for the Kiribati um, um, issues around prostitutes from the Korean fishermen in Kiribati, that they could take the voice, not me as the researcher, but that the information and that that's their ownership and that they take it with the recommendations of the group to advocate for that change. And I'll tell you some interesting stories about that um, a bit later. I'll get on through this and I'll tell us more stories later. So it's owned by them. Plus, we'll look at intersectionality. And that is that there are lots of layers in people's lives. There are layers of race, layers of identity, ethnicity, even in Indonesia. I mean, you know, huge population. You go from Java, and then you go to Wesi or Madang, or you go to Flores, uh, the more Christian area, or you go over to the Maluka, you know, the islands, the Spice Islands. There are different needs and different situations. And so participatory action research and intersectionality attempts to intersect all the different layers, men, women, gender, race, ethnicity, age, all these um, income levels, it layers, it is like a, that beautiful cake. I don't know what it's called, but it's my favorite cake. And in Indonesia, it's, lot, <laughs> it's a beautiful dense cake with lots of layers. Well, that's what intersectionality is. It's actually taking a bite of the whole piece, not just one little layer. It just taking, oh, it said unstable there. Uh, so it's like taking a bite of that cake which has got lots. Do you know the cake I mean, Javita? Uh, 
Hello, Javita. Yes, ma'am. Do you know the cake I'm referring to? The layered cake that you have in Indonesia that's very... Mm. What is that? We call it rainbow cake. Very dense rainbow cake. cake. Yes. Rainbow is, it, is it like a rainbow gear? Yes. Well, that's yes. what intersectionality yes. is like. It's you don't just take one little color, you actually take the whole rainbow, all right? <laughs> and the exercise, the aim is to reconstruct traditional power, the status quo, and identify where the imbalances are, and also uh, the political, personal, and the structural situations. So you have a situation that person is in, and then you have the structures of the institutions around them. And and those, so for women, when they're talking in consciousness raising about their lives and participatory action research, they think, oh, maybe I'm the only one that is having this experience. But in actual fact, you, if you start discussing and dialoguing, you will find that there might be a structure or a situation, or it's like a common issue. It's not just me. It is, in fact, about the way the society is structured and has an expectation of the way um, women should be perceived. Uh, um, look towards looking at structural change, not just change that will provide you with your maintenance of your daily life, but something in the long term, which will also improve the lives of your children and your girls and your boys, um, or of the representation of women in parliament, or the, some of the bigger issues that are really, or the health service in the case of Najma, um, that the doctors invite the women um, who have HIV AIDS in to talk to the medical students, for example. That's, you know, that's something that will hopefully contribute Tribute uh, to improve their women's brought into their medical training. And therefore, the capacity of each of those, the medical students in this example, and the um, HIV A, the women with HIV AIDS, they will both all build their capacity to try and improve uh, learning collectively. One thing's very important, as you know, uh, for any research is that prior informed con consent, and that in your university will likely to be a very specific ethical process as um, Iman and Najma both know um, that the the ethics approvals can take so much that participants share with you is their information and you have to be honest about how you're going to respect it, how you're going to use it and how you're going to protect it. So that's very important. And then there's also in any research, the interest, the importance of safety and care and respect and confidentiality when you're doing research. They're the same for all research. And those, this is just an example of those principles that the purpose for this is to make structural change, to increase the voice of women. It's owned by the women. Women and the community that you're elected, that those views are included and respected, and you aim to shift the power and build your collective action and the capacity and informed consent and safety and solidarity of all those involved in the process. Now, Anajma once again will tell you about this. There's varied, endless, creative and inclusive ways of creating a baseline of information when you're researching, because you need the baseline information to know where you're starting from and what you're ending. Is going to be, you know, and what's very um, successfully and, um, and apply the principles that we've just talked about and action and reflection and also to understand that there is a need to have a theoretical base for your research in order that you understand what it is that you're analyzing. You can't analyze everything. So when you do your thesis and your research project and your get it approved, in there you will have to be able to describe and have done literature research and understand what your theoretical base is for how you're going to analyze. analyze um, about that. 
And you need to plan and structure your learning for both of you in your relationship and get informed consent, as I said. Now, an example of some baseline um, uh, work that I've done is um, uh, in Cambodia when I was doing an urban renewal project and I was working with the health department and the NGOs and we were doing a baseline situation of the environmental and sanitation uh, status of three urban areas, Sihanoukville and two others. I'll have got it written down later. Um, not Battenbong, mm, maybe Battenbong. Um, and we, and those three areas, um, it was decided that it is very hard to measure the environmental um, situation in the short time that we had. And so we took, um, we all got cameras and decided, I had an observation of an area, and then we identified where the worst waste management was, for example, oil under the trucks, uh, bear, bear, from a bear factory, there was a lot of rubbish. And, and, and so around the hospital, there was a lot of, um, the rubbish tins were overflowing and that was high risk. Now, what we did for our baseline there is that we did a photographic baseline. And because we were implementing, they were going to be implementing new wastewater and waste management systems, the photographic idea was a good one because we could participate all and decide where we thought the most important areas were to see change. And we had about 10 areas that we prioritized to see the difference over time. And we could go back to the exact spot, take photos, no, we could um, had been um, had been improved. That's a creative way of participating creatively with um, um, with um, um, ideas for monitoring. Focus group discussions, of course, and all kind of research that happens where you brainstorm or you create a case study for discussions, um, drawing and chart brainstorming. Um, in Najma's case, they did a lot of performance, songs, puppets, drama, playback theater lots of different ways of communicating. And I think I think that's the native um, license um, to do, um, oops, it's gone, to do, um, uh, to do your research, photography, videoing, oh, time use, diaries, journals, monitoring the intake of food, things like that you can do um, journaling uh, that then can be analyzed. Um, and once again, I'm saying action and reflection uh, and action is essential. Now think about time use. Now the time use is interesting because particularly these and the reproductive roles and the production roles and the representational roles and things like that that women have um, in their lives and they're wanting possibly to improve those. But I'll come back to you and tell you about a discussion on time use where men and women, oh yes, I'll tell you now. It's a good time to tell you. <laughs> men and women were asked in Lombok at a review of the Lombok um, craft pottery project, the 10 year review in 19... 19- Nineteen ninety-eight. the men's roles were changing and the men who used to take the pottery um, and they used to walk around their Lombok um, and they had pots for birth, pots for water, pots for different ceremonies and they would market it. The women would make the pots and then the men would market it. Now this particular project um, uh, which New Zealand Aid was involved with for about 10 years bought a potter and tried to protect and preserve the pottery project, uh, the pottery in Bali. You may see some very large pots at, at the hotels, um, and they might be the ones from, I think, Banyamulik. They had very, made very big pots. Anyway, I won't go into the big detail, but when the men and women decided that the things were changing around them, and there was a risk to the different roles that they played, 
that the men felt they weren't having a role because the women were getting more money because they were exporting their pots and getting US dollars as the project improved and they were putting money aside for a foundation and life. Life was improving, for example, buying every day, they could now buy enough rice for a week. Um, and instead of going out to labor in the fields, they were now getting enough money from their pottery. So the men and women um, started to um, indicate that, you know, they, they monitored their time use, the men and the women. And then when they monitored it and came together and diaried their time, we um, then um, totaled up the time of the day and the things that they were doing. And we found that the men only were doing a few things, but the women Women were doing lots. So we maybe 10 or 12 different colors in their time use. And the men had about three, the same in Africa. And um, so we looked at where there was time and where the work, certain work was done. And the men and women ended up discussing the displacement of the men in the new pottery project because it was for women and it was investing in women and girls in the management of the project also. And because traditionally um, we had Philippines and China bringing in a lot more, they, they were seem not able to do the kind of work that they did. Anyway, in the past, they decided that they, and agreed with the women, they decided that they would do traditional weaving patterns into the pots. And so they became the decorators of the pots instead of having to leave the family all the time. And that way they could add value and get money for the pots. Now that's an outcome from the time use analysis where there was discussion about what the problem was, how the changes could occur and what the people working in a advising the scheme, the opportunities and earning capacity of the women. Uh, that's just an example of time use, how valuable it can be in participatory action research. I'm just checking, any questions? Um, ma'am, can I add something, ma'am? Yes, please, Najma. Okay, uh, so the audience, uh, so it's important to highlight what Margaret said that if you, you want to choose methods of participatory action research, you should ask your, your respondents what methods they like, whether they like to talk, whether they like to draw, or whether they like only to virtual meetings or just, and remember, you need to ask your participants that which places that they are prefer to discuss, for instance, uh, in restaurant or in the house or in hospital or just in other places that they feel relaxed to talk. Thank you, Margaret. Occasionally, I hope it's, um, it's okay. Okay, thank you, Najma. You could tell them lots of stories about um, you, you negotiating um, the ways in which you undertook the participatory research, can't you? You will carry on with that, right? Yes, because uh, we I deal with HIV positive women mostly, so it's yes. important to make their comfortable to talk about their voice. Remember, they they will not tell the truth story in the first meeting, that but they will tell you many things in the third or in the last meeting with them. So keep remember as a qualitative researchers, you should. Building trust is the important thing to understand the voice from the grassroots. That is Margaret. Thanks very much. The trust is a very important thing. That's building that relationship. Okay, well, let's move on now to intersectionality. I won't go in too much. I'm going to play a video if I can. I will try and work it, work the video. It's a 10 minute little piece. Um, because it's from the person, Kimberly Crenshaw, who explains the intersectionality. She coined the phrase intersectionality, but incorporating all the colors. Um, she's a professor of law at the University of California in UCLA, um, Los Angeles, and the Columbia Law School. 
and also executive director of the African Forum. And she calls intersectionality in the 90s. She indicated that it recognized the range of factors that we talked about, race, gender, different experiences. For example, the, um, uh, you know, in America, as you know, there's a lot of young men are incarcerated. Um, and you know, you've been watching the news, Black Lives Matter, because of the concern. about men have been are treated um, differently and they're trying to understand why this happens and try to eliminate racism from the police and from society and that doesn't seem to be getting much better but but um, she was very active in that movement as well as the gender movement and she has um, talks about this intersectionality being a prism if you know a glass it's got lo lots of movement and color through it um, as a framework well I can see a spelling mistake there as Oops, yeah, I will fix that up as a framework for seeing and oh, another. Other one and in society, who it happens to, who perpetuates it. And um, she says it's like a story well, a story wheel. Um, and it helps if you, you know, tell all the different sides of the story, it helps you understand and see things that we need to see. I will correct that the, before you get a copy, I will correct those few errors in that quote that I pulled out. Now, as a break, I'm going to try and play you this 10-minute um, um, uh, video of her. Can you hear? Mom, can you share also the link on the YouTube, uh, on the Zoom on the chat box? Yep. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. We cannot hear the sound of the video. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Yes. We cannot You've hear this, the sound of the video, ma'am. Oh, okay. So um, I've got it up as loud as I can. Uh, yeah. You, you can, can read it. You you can read it. Can that? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can see the video, it's but far we hard to read. Hear. In a way of increase. I'm up. Yeah, we can see the video, oh, but we can't okay. hear if, the sound. Can. Can you read it? Yes, we can. Okay, and it will be available from the PowerPoint. Uh, the students can watch it at another time as well. If they can't watch it now personally on their machine, they can, they can read it and then we will talk about it. It's just a way of having a bit of a break from my voice too. 
Okay. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Um, I can't see how I can increase it. Um, and
So, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can, ma'am. Yes, okay. So that's a bit about Intley talks about, uh, there's another couple of interviews here with her to watch. And the second one there is the one, if we won't have time, but um, later on, uh, it's about sexual harassment in the workplace. And she talks about um, uh, the differences between the way in which um, uh, the um, Oh, Anita Hill challenged a judge who had sexually harassed her as a lawyer. So that's one that looks at intersectionality in the workplace and it gives an example um, of sexual harassment policies. So I hope that you will be able to this. And there's another one on race, gender and inequality. It's about critical race theory. And um, it, uh, so that's now a challenge to the ideological and the, the structural um, unfairness that exists in um, that society that will help you reflect on what the issues are for your own society. So those are, you can watch later. We won't have time to do them now. Now, so now the third part of this um, piece is what is gender? I'll just check in case there's any questions on intersectionality. Have anyone got any questions on intersectionality? Nope. We can ask them. Can you understand me? Am I going too fast? I, am I clear or not? Yeah. Is there any anything that needs to change, Javita? Uh, everything is clear, ma'am. Ma but maybe uh, sometimes your connection is unstable, so we will lose your voice, ma'am. But actually, uh, overall, it is clear, ma'am. Okay. And Thank you. And not too yeah, and not too fast, ma'am. Thank you. Terima kasih. I will carry on then. Now we're getting to the gender bit and we've got a these slides because I can always come back to you or be in touch with students if they want to do another more in detailed um, assessment. But let's introduce you to the idea and you've got lots of resources to follow on with after this. Um, and Najma, please tell me if I'm in the right direction for you or if you want me to veer off in another direction. Okay, so what is gender? Well, gender is, it refers to the socially determined roles, responsibilities, uh, and behaviors of women as females and, and the masculinity. Of it's a socialized idea. It's that you are you are raised to do a particular thing in a particular way. And I know sometimes there's religion, or there's the society, or there's the formal situation, or there's the law that determines that you behave in a particular way. Now, at home, at school, in the media, at the church, at the mosque, and so on and so forth. Now, these behaviors, these cultural norms, it can be fine, and difference is fine. We're not looking for sameness, but what we are trying to understand is if the socialization limits opportunities or, um, you know, you're, to have a voice, for example, or to be respected and not violated, or, or to have an equal vote to men, or to own land like men own, or so on and so forth. Um, if it limits, if the socialization limits unfairly, opportunities for women and girls and favors men and boys, then in fact is why we are wanting to analyze um, gen with gender to see whether or not we've you the assimilated learning um, that can change over time. Time and it's determined by science, culture and your social situation and structure. And there are things that can improve to, to um, uh, to improve the lives of women and um, and girls. But at the moment, um, it is a socially determined concept. You, It's a sex, like biology and gender is different, is socially constructed. Sex you're born with, gender is constructed. Um, it is socially created. For example, there are studies that say little boys and girls, you put them together and you tell somebody this is the boy they picked up but they're actually boys 
people will lift them up and they'll say, oh, you're such a sweet, beautiful little girl. Oh, you know. And then the boys, which is actually a girl, lift it up and spoken to, they'll say, oh, you're a strapping young lad. You know, <laughs> you, know, you like your father or something. Um, now, even though the babies have been switched boy and girl, uh, the thing is that just as an example, the internet is and, and unstable, so I'll just stop. Uh, it is just an example of how we construct situations. One can't be changed so easily. Although nowadays, sexually, have opportunities to medically change their hormone levels in the surgery, ultimately, usually the biology doesn't change. But in the, and then gender, it can be changed. You can change the social, political, economic, education interventions, and you can improve the situation. So it has a belief that there you can work towards gender equality. Now, these roles, they sometimes imply difference, of course, difference. And as I said, difference is not in itself. We're not looking for sameness. We just don't want a discriminatory situation to be created by a division of labor. As you know, Kualuna, I'm as educated, or my husband's got a PhD, I haven't got a master's, but we still contribute similar income. We still, and, um, and, and yet there are particular things I do for the family and I make an effort for my boys to be equally engaged in their relationships. So I, rather than trying to change my husband, <laughs> although he's pretty, pretty fair with uh, the way he does things around the house, um, he, um, I will work to try to improve uh, the expectations of my son to be fair, to contribute to the household and not just assume Um, traditionally that a woman. Now, the other role is a reproductive one. Now, women primarily are uh, given the primary responsibility of the household, and they're trained for child rearing responsibilities. Now, I've seen Najma's husband doing as much almost, uh, you know, with the care of the children. And it was very, it was great to see how he supported her doing her PhD and income and took on big responsibilities with the children. And I know probably you'll analyze it differently, Najma, but um, it was great to see him picking up that responsibility. Um, the, the other role, um, it is that men have a greater role in decision making, maybe in generally in land titles and ownership and um, resources and decision making. And women um, often have less access to to um, resources and control. If you look at the banks and look at the statistics on loans at the banks, uh, women have a much greater um, challenge um, if they don't have assets behind them to prove that they're a worthy and reliable, um, uh, reliable um, source of a, for a loan. And this is why small enterprises but, um, revolving loans that gets that are created um, in societies and these revolving loans and banks that have proven that women if they can have access to that um, money to support their family they can get loans that they are very reliable in, in repayment and that was the assumption that they wouldn't be repaying the loans but that's proven to be wrong so now we have women's banks and we have revolving loans that um, and we, I remember one of the projects that I was working in in the Eastern Islands, um, it was a small holders project. It was the Islamic Development Bank and UN Ops. And the, um, one of the issues in Sulawesi was that land was going to be allocated for small holder raising chickens and so on and so forth. And um, the uh, sign off of the contract was going to be by the men. And I said, hold on. You know, how is this going to improve the position of women? The women are looking after the, including the boys, um, the chickens and the small goats and things that, that, that is not acceptable for them not to be on the contract process. So that was a structural change uh, that took place in that particular project to ensure that women's situation of access and control to those resources and the decision-making about how those resources were to be used, um, that's a story about how that structural change can occur. If somebody's doing a gender analysis, if somebody's just coming in and say, okay, that family, assuming the head of the household will sign,
women. Nothing will change the needs of women. Um, may have come. Uh, uh, this is an opportunity of ensuring that the, she has an equal share of the resources and the decision making because she's got a lot of the responsibility. So that's an example, another story about how that, um, how what I mean by this. And you know, as I talked about, gender roles have implications for life choices. Oops, I'll start again. I saw that it was unstable. Gender roles have implications for life choices and opportunities. So where there is inequality and at risk discrimination. That's where we need to make the change. So when we identify this division of labor, who's doing what, how for who, um, who's getting what for who to do what, when you ask those kinds of questions for male, female, boys and girls, you will come up with a much more nuanced, uh, a much greater depth of understanding about how you can recommend changes and what things can be discussed by the men and the women to make the changes um, that can occur to improve their life choices and opportunities. And uh, further on, I've got some links on CEDAW. Now, the other thing is your relationships. So we've looked at roles, abilities, the resources. Now we're looking at relations. Now, we used to look at women in development independently of men. We now look at gender relations. So by analyzing the uh, power relationships, whether they're unequal, whether there's bias, which is unconscious or conscious between the women and girls and the men and the boys in a culture and a society, and we consider identity, class, gender, and race, and look at all the differences in these influences and relationships, we get a better is happening. Who's gaining? Who's losing? Who's dominating? Is it fair? Can it be fair? Can it be made more just? So that's why we look at the roles. And we aim for gender equality where there's no discrimination. There's opportunities for both men and women to access and control the resources, and it's not based on, um, on, on sex. Um, for example, when uh, Jacinda Ardern, you know her, our prime minister, I just saw a film about her science advice. Advisor. Now she's called a dame. She's just able to communicate science very succinctly. And she reflected on her life and opportunities. And she was very often on a board trying to improve the representation um, of women. And when she was on the board, she was often look around and she was the only scientist woman, scientist. And um, she was on this company and she was actually asked to make some selections because the women's affairs had tried to get every board to at least have one woman. And now they're getting quotas and all kinds of things. And even some of them are dominated by women now because we've got a lot. A lot of women and improve my, my situation too. Anyway. She was sitting there and she kept seeing these men and appointing men. And she said, you know, in order to get change, I had to use humor. She decided she was not going to stamp her foot and, and say, you know, this is not fair. This is, she said, you know, I just want you to stop for a minute. And I just want to ask you all men here, are we hiring, are we appointing on the basis of kilogram weights? And they laughed they realize what she meant is the men were big women. Um, that's just an example of, of how you can bring about change. If you've got a lens on, which is say, we want more gender equality. We want gender equality. We don't want to discriminate. We want more representation of women. We want fairer representation of the ideas and the voices um, of the range of voices that can contribute. Uh, and therefore, that was the way she um, worked on putting on her lens and deciding she was going to challenge the appointment process. And and she got structural change. So your research doesn't just go on in your academic life. When you have a consciousness raised about equality and fairness and justice, 
then you use it in lots of different ways in all your decision making. So we're aiming to get women and girls, men and boys to have equal conditions to realize their full potential and to get benefits that they contribute to from economic, social, cultural and political development. And why is it important? Because we all have responsibilities and UN CEDAW was ratified Ratified, the country ratified it um, in July 24. I just wait till it more stable, becomes more stable. I just wait until it became more stable. Um, in July 24, 1984, it became law, and your convention has now become legally binding. And Indonesia takes efforts, it says, to eliminate gender based discrimination against women, and they report on the progress of it. And I've put a, a link down there for you to look at it. So poverty is a gender issue with 70% of the world's poor are women and girls. And yet they do most of the work to try and get some half the population gets limited with its learning opportunities if it doesn't have equal access to girls and boys to education and the social and economic development access to loans and bank money and um, land ownership and all these things. And it's necessary for humanity to be sustainable with our human development. And gender equality is an essential part of that so we can reduce poverty. Where women and men are both drivers of the economic development, they should be equally rewarded. And as you know, we have conventions that you're committed to in your country. Um, and And you can have a look at those. I've put you, given you documents of the human rights documents and the CEDAW documents and um, your report um, to on CEDAW to um, the United Nations. So you can have further look at that in more detail um, in more detail later. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am, yes. for interrupting. Yes. yes. Uh, we only have 10 minutes left, ma'am. Okay, so I will move on then. Um, we will get through the gender equality and I will leave you with an exercise to do. And then we will, uh, I will, briefly go straight on to the sexual about gender, intersectionality, disparate reaction research. I'll open up for questions very shortly. I will just say that um, you, there's a saying here to educate a woman is to educate a family. The saying goes on to educate a man is to educate an individual. While it's not absolutely true, we do know that if you educate women, that that is the one single factor that will improve gender equality and the lives of girls and women in society. So as you know, you're all educated, you all have the opportunity, um, what a difference it will make to your lives. So I'll try and move on. Promoting gender equality, I talked about resistance and in unequal power structures. I, we, you can read those. I've told you the story about Gerard, the um, Jacinda Ardern, our Prime Minister's um, science advisor. I just want to mention to you that we did have women in development. I mentioned that we were just looking at sustaining women's lives as they are. That was women in development, only looked at women. Now we look at the power relationships um, uh, so we can have fair and inclusive things that we can look at the structural change, not just the situation. Some references for theories and models that you can use in your research and I'm always happy to send on some more information to you to use and to discuss at any future time. So the gender and development, we're moving with gender and development and with sustainable development. So we want to empower women, we want to remove the social and economic inequalities and the political inequalities, create new governance structures, legal changes for example. We now have our policemen uh, who if they get if they complain about a police example, uh, if the men says to the policeman, oh, I, no, it's okay, we're okay, we solved it, the men, the police will still take action and remove the man from the situation if he's violated the family. Uh, so to, to, do, to cool down the situation. Our policemen drive around with domestic violence as a crime because now it is... Uh, it is their responsibility to take action and not just to 
uh, when there's been a complaint of violence that's intergenerational and it's likely to affect the whole family and the woman, they want to keep the woman safe, keep the family safe, and they're responsible for taking action. So the uh, thing about the most agencies are adopting the gender and sustainable development approach. In New Zealand, we're fortunate we have a Treaty of Waitangi to challenge our colonial um, our colonialism, our dominance as a culture on the Māori community. And um, uh, so we have a treaty which we are responsible for. So in, when we put policies to government now, we have to report on the gender and social impacts and the impacts on Māori. So there is a system that's been structured into our decision-making process that will take account, not just of trying trying to sustain society. So we try and mainstream this. That's an example of how it's mainstreamed. I won't go into this in too further detail, but it's mainstreamed in that when you put a policy, you have to also say how it's affecting men and women, how it's going to affect Māori, and what are the social implications for particular groups in society. So you could take a gender neutral approach, which is recognizing that, it, that gender has an influencing factor in social outcomes, but it's not really just acting or gender responsive. And that means looking at some tangible ways you create equitable All right, it's not only about women, it's not only about benefiting women, but if you look at the relationships of men and women and who's gaining, who's losing, and the situation and structures around men and women in society, you will then be committed to hopefully making a much more um, gender responsive, um, take gender responsive action. I will just go on that the mainstreaming aims to look at the implications for legislation, policies, programs, resourcing, budgets, and all those kinds of things. And it's ultimately to aim to achieve gender equality. And I will planning. Um, to be responsive. And there are two ways of doing that. There's one looking at your practical needs, just the practical needs and sustaining the status quo, or looking at the strategic needs. The strategic needs look at structural change. So when you're doing your research and you're looking at the position of women or the position of your problem, also look at the structural issues, the power relations. And in those power relations, there will be issues around gender relationships. When you look at sex disaggregated data, you can analyze it. If you don't analyze this, an example, when you use statistics, use them creatively. Now, our family planning association when it reported how many young girls were getting pregnant under the age of 20, they didn't say, oh, 6,000 girls under the age of 20 and 19 such and such got pregnant. They said to Parliament, imagine two secondary schools full of pregnant girls. That's how many young women are getting pregnant before you know, the age of 20, right? So... so that they are able to influence and advocate for change. Now, I can't, haven't got time to go into too much of this participatory planning example. Um, I've talked about the workload in Lombok. That was a good example. I'll tell you one story about my participatory process um, where we negotiated a very large research project over two years and it ended up we invited the prime minister and all the planners there. Now one of the discussions, this is a very important discussion looking at time, the amount of time that women went, um, women spent getting water, getting fuel, wood, uh, to cook for their families and sustain their families and to reduce nutrition, uh, malnutrition. They were concerned about it because they were walking a long way away from the house to do all the weeding because there were tractors. And now the tractors meant that there were large lots of land and that meant more weeding for the women and the children were getting malnutrition because they were away from their home and didn't get fed till they were tired late at night and went to sleep without food. So we were talking about this and we said, you know, I said, To them, they said, "Oh, but it's traditional that women bring and and carry the um, carry the wood." 
And I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I've seen men cooking and they laughed and I've seen men carrying water and they laughed. And I said, and I've seen the men in the fields and they laughed because they thought I was going to say weeding, which I wasn't. Um, I said, you know, and they said, oh, I said, you know, things can change and they do change if it has an interest for the men. And they said, explain that further. And I said, well, men carry water. No, no, women carry water. I said, no, no, men. do if it's on the back of a truck They'll, from the match factory if they can sell it up on the hill and men are cooking in the streets because they're earning money and they've got their little um, sustainable technology savvy um, uh, ovens and the men are on the you know in the fields but they're on the tractors and so we said well what's what what's changing then if the men are carrying out all these roles that they say women carry out well, it was the inside outside. Women are doing all that work for nothing and men will do it if there's. Money, but if there's transport and men will do it if they uh, if they have the, you know, the the um, the acknowledgement through all those things, money, um, you know, control of the technology uh, are able to um, use the transport and so on and so forth. So in our society, men started cooking when we got microwaves. So um, I just wanted to point out that was a very good example of how the resistance uh, to change um, when you're doing planning and discussing planning issues, always think about good stories because um, that will explain. There were practical issues for women that could have been addressed, but there were also what we call strategic issues that really will challenge the structural change that women need to improve their lives. Um, I'm going to put, go on um, further now to re and recap. And I've told you the stories that I wanted to tell you and I've only got a few more minutes. Oh, I just, um, so there we had the discussion about changes and challenges to women. I told you the story about the Lombok Division of labor time of the community um, and use of resources. That was with the uh, geothermal project in Flores and in Sumbawa. I didn't tell you much about that. And we did talk about monitoring and evaluation and joint signing of signatures in Indonesia. So I've given you all the stories throughout the lecture so far. So you're not missing out on anything there. I told you about the photographic one in Cambodia. I've told you that story. And um, there are a few other stories I told you about the Pacific Island Forum, women sitting around the table taking the information and presenting the situation and challenging uh, what they wanted to see happen in terms of changes. And the other thing is interesting, we talked about resistance. Now in Kiribati, when we were doing some studies on prostitutes, with the prostitutes, on child protection, and I won't go into the big story, but when they did take the um, recommendations to Korea, and there were Koreans there who were concerned that the Korean fishermen were exploiting the girls, and there was an increase in HIV AIDS, the women, they said, can we come to your country and see what's happening? And yes, they were invited, they came, because the girls were called Korea and Korea. They were ships and all kinds of things. There were some real sad stories being abused and not being protected by the police and being taken in for immigration um, uh, abuses because they went to the ships and all kinds of things. And there were pimping and all that kind of stuff. But when the Koreans came to, Kur to, Kur to Kiribati to try and see what was happening, you know, they were more keen to change the name from Korea to Korea to something else then actually the concerns about the women prostitutes, the abuse that went on and the, um, and the, the things that needed to change with the Korean fishermen on. And care about you. Um, now, this is something that you could do in your class. I would like you to, oops, it's unstable. This is something I would like you to do Sorry. in your class so we can finish up now. We, this, this is in a case study, and if you could do it in your class, Najma, it would be interesting for them to just to reflect on what they'd learned today, 
by analyzing a case study and then considering what they would do about it. So it's an engineering company um, that made some decisions and um, there were There was a concept. Now, we can't go into a lot of this today, but you heard your vice director saying what um, sexual harassment was, and these are definitions of workplace harassment, sexual harassment. I've given you some manuals about uh, how New Zealand challenges it, and there are some examples of sexual harassment policies. The important thing is that you communicate well uh, with the issue that you're dealing with. And I'm quite happy to have one more session with you on this because we've run out of time. We started very late. Uh, the, the confidentiality of laying a complaint, being able to have a good process of laying a complaint, being, uh, being able to uh, have a change in attitude, as you heard said at the introduction with your um, project manager or vice director about how important it is for education. So you create a culture and a work environment that's respectful and that you also have policies in place when you're hiring where you the values of your institution or your university And I'm very happy to take this further, but we've run out of time and I'm very sad about this, but um, it's workplace bullying and sexual harassment. So if you put it into a legal definition where you have a process um, for having a respectful work environment and a non-bullying environment and a gender sensitive one, um, then you will go a long way to be able to create policies that will work that the, the heads of your organization and that everybody when they comes in, come into your organization and the university parents of sexual harassment. Thank you. Um, I've, we've run out of time. Uh, Tadi Makasi, um, if there's any time for questions, I will take them. I'm sorry it's been so rushed. Uh, I hope it's actually been valuable for you. Hello? Hello. Right. Hello. Okay. Hello. Um, terima kasih, Ma Margaret, for the explanation. Yes. So we already have some questions. Yes. Uh, on the chat box. Yes. Okay. The first question coming from Linggar Jati from Sriwijaya University. Cases of sexual harassment that I have ever encountered occurred in my classmate. The abuse made him depre depressed and often injured himself with sharp objects. What is the right way to restore his spirit? Is reminding him of the family he cares about the right way to go, ma'am? Yes, so I'm just getting the question, rules is this, is this. So, it, um, so I, I got cut off in a minute there. Can you just repeat that? He has been depressed and it reminds him of his yeah. family. What is the question? Her, her friend being depressed yes. and he usually uh, injured himself with sharp objects. Can you understand me? Yes. Well, the uh, of having a policy to prevent, as your, one of your leaders said, to prevent the problem before it starts. Once it starts in our university at AUT, we always had a non-bullying value system. We had a structure where people could go so they didn't get to holding on the problem for themselves. They could, uh, they had a mechanism for addressing it. We had, uh, we had mental health counseling services immediately available. And that that person needs 
so that they don't perpetuate the violence back onto themselves. So it's a very, and it, and it illustrates, it's a very sad, and I'm sorry to hear about this example, but it illustrates why we need laws against sexual violence. And one of your Adina Rahaya Rizmaliani from Steikmas Abdanusa Palambang asked, why do we need laws against sexual violence? And this is exactly the reasons why we need laws. Because we live in a patriarchal society where men assume that they can violate women more often than not, or we're in a situation at universities where there are power relations where somebody's got power over another person and you might find yourself complying with a behavior that you don't particularly want because you don't want your marks to be affected. Um, and it can really disadvantage you. And it it couldn't be why we need it. Um, New Zealand's a good example, our Human Rights Commission and our laws. I've given you some references there to look at how, um, what those look like. Um, and it doesn't only happen within, uni I'd say all of our universities have sexual harassment policies, but in spite of that, it still occurs. And it did occur um, at the university I was at, but there were people who were trained advocates, who were trained to be confidential, who were trained, oh, they were a first point of contact for the person who was sexually harassed, but they had the responsibility to take that issue further, to first of all, make sure that the person was safe, that the person who was bullying was reprimanded, taken, you know, had the opportunity of explaining themselves, but it was in a mediated process. But the first thing that's most important is that that person gets the care that they need. So making sure that you have good counseling services, confidential counseling services, mental health services, support networks that will be there for people before they lay the complaint. Some may not want to lay a complaint, but to have a complaint procedure where the abuse has been protected. All right. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your explanations. How about Lingarjati? Is it clear? The answer is Margaret. Lingarjati, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I think it's clear. Okay, thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you for asking. Okay, ma'am. Uh, the next question. From Sarah Febrianti, Sriwijaya University, how to prevent sexual harassment on women with the root cause is the patriot, patriot, patriarchal culture, patriarchy, man, patriarchy culture that exists in society. Is it possible to remove the patriarchy culture in our country, especially in Indonesia, man? Oh, yes, it's possible. The more people that are educated about um, gender relations and the more people that want to see a fairer society and the more the more practical ways to analyze it, understand it, advocate for change, um, look at the CEDAW reports that your government is trying to make changes in, um, be well informed um, about those changes and challenge, you know, have support networks uh, that actually do are prepared to challenge things that are happening at the, in your case, maybe at the university or having friends or sisters or brothers. If you're in a violent situation at home where you can, uh, your family, you know, is able to um, protect you and know that if you need the fact that you need protection and don't insist that you return to a violent situation. There has to be consequences for any violations um, uh, by the patriarchy, which is a whole structural change. It'll go on for generations, um, the, the challenge. But, um, but you have to believe that things can change. And I, I in my, I'm now nearly 70. And in my lifetime, I could spend days telling you about things that have changed. There are always things that will need to be um, reassessed and reevaluated. But if 
after you've got, you have a value system, Judaism religion, you all have um, some basic tenets of um, respect and, and non-discrimination, and you have a lot of values that are very, very similar, and that's what human rights are. They are respect for a set of values for humanity, and if we have humanity in the forefront and fairness and justice and equality as our interested outcome with more social justice, then we will challenge patriarchy. We will find practical ways of improving the lives of women and children and uh, those who are not so well off or disabled, some need in particular to take a, be taken account of. All right. All right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, how about Sarah Febrianti? Is it clear? The answer of ma'am Margaret? Yes, that's clear. Thank you, ma'am. And I think, um, thank, thank you, but I think it's also looking at laws, um, policies, looking at budgets, looking at attitudes, looking at language, all these things. Everywhere you look, mm. when you are heightened to a gender response, you will see where changes Because you're part of the change. Yeah, all right. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for your explanations. So we are going to the next questions from Nanda Irwantika from Sriwijaya University. In several cases, I have encountered regarding the misuse of a photo of a woman and then used as a photo of prostitution or some kind of sexual product and the, poli and the police in my country ignore this case even though the law has regulated the misuse of other people's photo. So how do we deal with, it, with this? And does this case include sexual harassment? I mean, can, can you repeat the last part? Mm -hmm. How do you prevent that, yes? Yeah, the misuse of a photo of a woman, ma'am. And then, yes. yes, it is sometimes the photo of a woman uh, used as a photo of prostitution or some kind of sexual product. And the police in her country ignore this case, even though the law has regulated the misuse of other people's photos. So how do we deal with this? And does this case include sexual harassment? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me, ma'am? I, I last few bits. I said, "How? What can we do about this?" And um, and then the last little piece the, you said. The misuse uh, photo yeah, of a woman. Yeah. Oh, yes, I got the misuse of photo, and I got the fact you asked me what the police didn't do anything about it. And what was the last yeah. bit of the question? The very last few lines of that question. And does this case include sexual harassment? Uh, Um, yes, it is a form of sexual harassment of your country. You should have a complaints procedure in the media that allows it to be taken further if the police don't respond. Um, what is very important is for everyone to protect their own images. But when people abuse it, it is the abuser that needs to have a consequence. And it will, uh, and it's too easy to misuse this. Um, if the police are not, um, you can lay a police complaint. If they're, and, and you have to know the law that you're laying the complete complaint again. It's because you can damage a form of sexual harassment. Um, uh, and it's a very, it's a worldwide problem. It's not just an Indonesian one because you can have the laws in place. You can have the policies in place. You can, um, and you'll always have individuals abusing it. But if the police are not doing their job, they should be called to account. And if the laws are uh, adequate, then it's not the law that needs to be changed, but it's attitudes and it's a, um, there might be some other, if I knew the exact situation, if that was my friend, then I would find a way of finding out who that did that. And I would find it with your own hands, but uh, the consequences can be major. So you have a law, you have the police not doing their job, they need to be, and you need to have a complaints procedure with the media that is acted on. Because too often we don't act because we think they're not taking account of us. And so we don't follow it up. 
but it's very important that that person is supported and whoever's making those complaints that her friends respond to protect her and make sure that that um, abuse um, is is um, you take all these risks, um, the person themselves protect the woman all right okay okay how nanda irwantika how about the answer is it clear thank you. yeah yeah thank you very much that's very clear ma'am i'm sorry okay. about that situation all right thank uh, you nanda irwantika for the questions and now we are going to the next question, ma'am. Yes. Uh, from Marita Elsa Widiana from Sriwijaya University. Many of the cases of sexual harassment reported yes. on television and social media receive negative comments about the victim. For example, like, why didn't the victim fight back? Why doesn't the victim run away from the, uh, from, from the perpetrator? And why the victim in wear skimpy clothes. What I want to ask is how to prevent and deal with this with the people who blame the victim for, for the for the abuse the victim experience. Yes, that's that's a very interesting, challenging question. I think uh, um, I think is by the consciousness of people being aware that that actually happens. For example, in our country, often child abuse was never brought out because the ch child is not believed or the woman doesn't take um, a, a situation even in my own family where um, a young girl who was um, abused and she did not want to take a complaint because of the process was so labor intensive and there were no witnesses. So it is, It, well, through our own empowerment and through discussing this and for understanding what that it is wrong and that um, um, that there should be action taken and that blaming the victim is a process that occurs in all societies across all issues. Um, but, but I think, for example, now that I, I would say my consciousness is raised, if somebody tried to blame me for uh, them abusing me, I have done a self-defense course with my rights because I know that person uh, that, that not, oops, the internet's un unstable again. They know, I know that um, I would challenge, I would challenge that I would not accept being that victim because uh, you know I can assert my own rights but in the case of my niece when she did not want to take it to the police um, I insisted because of the reason that if she that she has a responsibility to others um, but they would blame me. No, it's not about blaming you. It's about taking action on a situation. If she chooses not to take um, that situation to the police, then that person just perpetuates it. So I provided her with the support. I got the rape crisis. I took her to the hospital for examination. She didn't take it in. She ended up taking it to the police, but she ended up not taking it to the court. She did not want to be exposed to the court. But a passage uh, that requires the police to, to take action against that particular person, she was told that he was in prison because he had this other actions. Uh, he had um, he had abused others. And there'd also some physical violence that he hit this person had been caught for. And they had a test so they could do a DNA test on him. And so um, I think if you're being blamed, find somebody, if you're being the victim and being blamed, um, is find somebody.
anybody who can, um, I would suggest every girl does self-defense training and assertiveness classes. Um, but there is also challenges in, our, in, in the family too, where there's been abuse and that person that abused has been challenged by the others. There was an intervention. So I think it's important to build up strong families that will not tolerate abuse, will not, will not, will listen uh, to women and listen to children and listen to those who have been abused. So I think it's a societal change, um, both Yeah. With victim blame. For example, in New Zealand, we had a big problem where when a girl got raped, she was wearing a short dress. The short dress was blamed for the rape, not the rapist blamed for the rape. Or, for example, with prostitutes. I was working on legalize, not legalizing, decriminalizing prostitution because if women are abused and seen to be blamed for seducing the men, they will not get the police protection if they're abused and they won't get the health services to protect themselves from perpetuating HIV, AIDS, getting... <coughs> getting HIV. The important thing is to look at the issues, in that case, the prostitution, to look at where the victim blaming is and to identify where you can make changes, support the person who's being the victim and being blamed and challenge the blaming. All right. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for the explanations. How Mareta El Sawidiana? Is it clear? Yes, it's clear. Thank you for the answer, ma'am. Okay. Okay, thank you for the questions. So maybe I would like to give a second change for the, for the audience to ask directly to ma'am Margaret about the questions. I see that there is Melda right in the chat box. Maybe you can ask directly to my to my Margaret. I give I'll you time and space if you if you would like to give directly questions to my Margaret. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Jovita. Um, my question, um, uh, the last, how many problems in our country uh, such as about sexual nourishment? But the other side, we can show this problem to our fall, uh, to our law, maybe police, uh, because negative stigma related. So how about this problem to complete, ma'am? Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Can it be repeated? Um, in Indonesian translate, um, banyaknya permasalahan uh, pelecehan seksual di Indonesia, uh, tetapi di sisi lain uh, kita takut untuk uh, mengadukan kepada pihak berwajib karena uh, banyaknya stigma negatif kepada yang melapor gitu. Nah, bagaimana uh, kita bisa mengatasi hal, -hal demikian? All right. So the question is that, ma'am, uh, there are uh, there are still uh, many cases about sexual harassment around us, and then maybe some of victims are afraid to uh, to tell about the story because they are afraid about the negative stigma that they will get, ma'am. So we are as a students how to overcome that kind of situation. Well, if, if that was happening at a university that I was at and I was, um, and we knew it was occurring, say, for example, there was a lecturer and as it has occurred in most of our universities at various times, um, and there is, is, I'm assuming there is no system in place to have a complaint procedure. Is that correct? Yes, if there is no right. to make a uh, yes. So if first of all, um, and you will remember Najma, we had a number of people like um, number of people who were advocates. They were sexual harassment officers. They were trained to understand sexual harassment. That's something that's worth putting into place. 
and then they work on a policy to get it approved at the university level. But if there's nothing there, then I would say your friends, so long as you can respect that they will be confidential and that they aren't the abusers, then you need to work on a strategy and get the support. to get the that a group of you um, if they know there's a repeated um, repeated harassment you should be going to somebody that you trust to say this is happening in confidence not by yourself as an individual but with a group and start forming a team to uh, get training in sexual harassment training and uh, advocacy so people know you can go to an independent person who who is ethically responsible, who knows where to support you, who knows who can take you, or it may be another academic, or it might be somebody in your system that you know you can trust and figure out a strategy for taking further action. Because if you are being sexually harassed, it's likely that other people are being sexually harassed. So. Do you have a, a women's organization or a group, a gender group or some group that could work on trying to devise a policy and being a support system in the first instance so that whoever's being abused can come and talk and work through a way of solving this problem and address yes, their needs? Because it could be that their marks are getting low. Yes. Yeah. So I would first, if you've got nothing in place, I would first start with that. Getting a group together, coming up with a draft policy, looking at the examples that already exist. The ILO have them, New Zealand have them. You can adapt it for your own purposes, making sure that it's across bullying as well as sexual harassment so that it's any violation of one's human rights or violation of one's person. Because there also should be something in the policy that when a person, say they're an academic, if they're in a power relationship that is, you know, can ruin somebody's academic life. And so they need to be challenged. You know, the academics need to be able to support um, uh, a process whereby uh, there is a complaint process, there's a policy for proaction active education, and that's a value system at the university. But for that person, I would say a group that you trust to help you work through um, a solution while you're working on getting a strategic change at the university. All right. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I think that's a very clear explanation. How about Melda? Is it clear, Melda? Okay, clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. But maybe it is. It would be the last, very last question. But I, I would like to give uh the chance for Adam to ask directly to Ma'am Margaret. You can open your mic, Crawford. Well, thanks for the change. Uh, okay. I'd like to ask that recently the news of sexual harassment is coming from the victims on family then is the role of the family itself as the first agent of agent in sex and gender socialization has to be adopted is it time to use the role of the education in schools to incorporate sex education and gender socialization into the edu edu educational curriculum Thanks, ma'am. Yes, I, I would I find it very hard to say uh, when it's time. I would say every, it, it always um, it is there is a role um, for the schools. The children spend so much time in the schools, as well as the sexual education in terms of respect for others, girls and boys. I've always wanted to print a T-shirt that says uh, for uh, do your homework or eat your breakfast, make your bed, do your homework and respect women. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there are lots of creative ways that you can provide education. But education formally, I think, is important. At what level? I haven't studied enough to know what's appropriate at what level. I'm sure there are examples of how you 
introduce children to issues. Around, um, I think the school does have a role. For example, uh, when my son was at Indonesian uh, Jakarta International School, uh, when he was a, uh, at there, uh, his he had to look after a computer baby for two days, uh, change its nappies, feed it when it cried, take it to rugby and get somebody to look after it. And that two days <laughs> of looking after a baby was the best sex education he could have because he realized how much, how much. <laughs> work was involved child and being a responsible uh, partner. Uh, the other thing is um, I am an advocate for ensuring at all the universities is that there are condoms always available. I know not always agrees with me because some people say, oh, that's just a way of promoting sex. And I said, no, it's a matter of making sure that people stay healthy. So it depends on what you look at when you're saying, should it happen? Is it a moral question? Is it a health question? Is it a gender question? Um, for all those reasons, I worry that there is a planned staged sex education in schools. But ideally, parents also should be included in that. And we have opportunities for sex education with parents. So you can ask questions. Otherwise, you don't know whether the children are getting the right answers because sometimes parents find it very hard to talk about sex education and um, children will find it out. But in a school, you can control what they learn. Maybe you can control it in a way that's more helpful, um, um, but you don't want necessarily sex education to be bound up with a morality that says no or yes or wrong or right, but you need to maybe focus on the health aspect, on the responsibility of being a parent, on responsible, respectful behavior. So it's not only about sex education, it's actually about sound relationships. No means no. Um, you know, if a woman says no when she's having sex, it means no. In our, in our country, that means, uh, If you can prove your sentence, that's against the law. So, um, you know, you would have to work uh, sensitively um, and I think with a health focus and with, um, you know, respectful behavior focus uh, so that you can, um, uh, and also making sure that your nurses at your schools, if you have them, um, uh, are open to, um, to honest, relationships about a need. For example, if a young girl should perceive not, should not be being sexually active, but is, and she wants oral pill, then she should be able to have access, in my opinion, to that right. But I know in other societies, that's not always acceptable. So I think the clear answer is yes, but with a health focus, knowing, understanding biology, but respecting gen respectful gender relations and um, and making sure that there's respect at the heart of um, not only uh, sex education, but sexual relations. So sexual relations need to be part of it. Okay. Okay, how Adam, is it clear? The answer yes, of my mother. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, Thank last minute question. Yeah, last minute question. Everyone want to jump before we close? Anyone? Before we close the lecture, last minute questions. Okay, I think it's enough, yeah, ma'am. I think Thank it's you. enough. There are no more questions. There's no more questions. And after lecture, um, Well, the previous explanation was such a mind-blowing explanation, ma'am, for me, actually, <laughs> especially for me, actually. And also, there are so many insights, uh, new knowledge, and also, also mind-blowing perspective, new perspective uh, about uh, the issue of 
gender inequality and also about sexual harassment and also women's right itself, ma'am. And I think uh, it is so really beneficial for us as a student uh, to uh, to know about how to solve such a problem, ma'am. Uh, okay, maybe uh, we can give applause to ma'am Margaret. Everyone, you can have it on the chat box or you can send a sticker. So, are you asking me to stay or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, are, are there, if there are more questions or? No, ma'am. Uh, that is the last questions. So this is the end of our lecture today, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for your time, for your, um, for your new, for your um, insight and knowledge for us. And we are so grateful for having you today, ma'am. And hopefully, maybe oh, someday nice. we can directly meet in Indonesia, ma'am. Or maybe we can go to New Zealand to meet you, ma'am, and also yes. learn directly from you. Yes, because okay. Iman, where's Iman? Is she there? Or is she going to talk? Or yes, I think oh. so. Is she so going to? You oh. him. She will talk after you later. Oh, okay. So will I stop now and let her carry on? I can see Fultanafon in there as well, hiding in there. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you can, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Maybe okay. We'll, well, you can have the this um and 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 all the links um you on YouTube and all the resources yeah. are there for you to um and to to have and use. So I hope um I'm sorry it just had to be rushed through so quickly, but hopefully the stories and the experience help to explain a little bit more clearly um what was intended. Yeah. And thank you for the privilege. Thank you, Najma. <laughs> All right, maybe Bu Najma want to add something. And thank you, Javita, for organizing so. Um, yeah, you're welcome, man. Thank you very much okay. for the audience, my students, and other guests from Bibern University in Indonesia. And we have other guests too from Laos, Myanmar and some guests from New Zealand. Thank you very much for your coming. And special guests from my teachers, my tutors, Margaret Leniston. Uh, Jovita, my ch my children call Margaret is grandma. So it's very oh, interesting. Oh, yes. I, 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 I have to my tell the story. Oh, okay. I have to tell the story that, um, Mo, Mo, uh, Mo, not Mohammed, your little boy's name. Mohandas. Mohandas. Oh, Mohandas. Mohandas. Oh, yes. Um, yes. Mohandas was born on the day my mother, who died at 90 years old. So that makes us forever connected. One life gone and a new one started. Thank you, Mum, for your time. Back to you, Jovita. You're, 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 you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Benajma and Ma'am Margaret Lannison. Thank you so much, Ma'am, for your time. We are so grateful for having you. And see you next time, Ma'am. Javita, thank, thank you. And for yeah. university. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so much you. love. Oh, well, I'm going okay. to stay and listen. <laughs> uh, love you, Ma'am. <laughs> okay. okay. Maybe that's all. Um, terima kasih buat teman-teman semua audiens yang sudah menyimak lecture kita pada hari ini. Jangan lupa ingatkan buat teman-teman semua untuk mengikuti challenge yang diberikan oleh panitia untuk mendapatkan door prize ya teman-teman. Karena kita ada door prize uh, untuk 10 peserta ya teman-teman. Nantinya akan diumumkan di Instagram kita di feel underscore unsri. So yang belum follow, uh, follow Instagramnya dulu nanti akan lihat pengumuman di sana gitu siapa kira-kira 10 participant that will be lucky to get door prize gitu ya. Oke. Okay. Uh, dan juga oke, okay. dan juga jangan lupa sertakan uh, screen, screenshot-nya ya teman-teman, screenshot-nya um, terkait dengan kegiatan pada hari ini gitu. Oke, okay, but this is not the end of our meeting because we still have Miss Amon that will be share about New Zealand scholarship and also international student experience after this. Just uh, five until 10 minutes. 
So, uh, but before we are going to Miss Amon, I will I will give it back to Master of Ceremony to lead uh, the quiz. Thank you. Okay, thank you, moderator, and thank you, Mama Garden for the useful material today, and also to the audience for your great enthusiasm. Now, we continue to the next agenda. Here we play an exciting quiz related to the topic we discussed in this morning. Uh, to all particip participants, please open Slido and enter the code. The code is friends two one zero nine two one. One more, the code is friends two one uh, zero nine two one. Baik kepada seluruh peserta, silakan untuk membuka Slido dan masukkan kode pagar dua satu kosong sembilan dua satu. Sekali lagi, kodenya adalah bintang eh, maaf pagar dua satu kosong sembilan dua satu. To the audience, oh, here we gave maybe, 15 minutes to answer the, the quiz and time is yours. Okay, maybe the committee could share the uh, the instruction into the chat box. Sekali lagi untuk kepada uh, kepada peserta silakan untuk membuka slido dan memasukkan kode bi, uh, pagar 210921. Sekali lagi kepada seluruh peserta silakan untuk membuka slido dan memasukkan kode pagar 210921. Jika kurang jelas, panitia sudah mengirimkan uh, slide kodenya di room uh, chat room. Kepada teman-teman yang sudah bergabung dan sudah memasukkan kode slide-nya, dimohon untuk menjawab pertanyaan sekarang juga. Dan saya beritahukan sekali lagi untuk um, waktu dari pertanyaannya, satu menit per satu, satu pertanyaan.
One more, to all participants who have not changed the Slido, please open the Slido and enter the code. We are waiting for the quiz until uh, one minute again. Okay, thank you audience for your great answer. Now, we will continue on the next agenda. There is sharing session, which will be chaired by Ms. Jovita. To the Honorable Ms. Jovita, time is yours. All right, thank you, Gracepa, for the opportunity. So we are going to the next agenda, that is sharing session from uh, Ms. Amon, uh, maybe the committee could share screen the draft presentations of Ms. Amon. How the committee could you share screen? All right. Okay, but first of all, let me say hello first to Miss Amon. Hello, Miss. Hi. Hi, Jovita. Nice to okay, see you. Thank you. Uh, okay, but but sorry, I call you Miss Imon or or or, yep. or something. Yeah. How to spell it? It's Imon. E I M O N. Imon. Imon. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Miss, for uh for being able to be here to sit with us, and then would like to share about international student experience, especially in New Zealand. That maybe you also want to share about the opportunity to get scholarship, uh, to from one of university in New Zealand, ma'am. So, Miss Imon, uh, she is uh. But before that, Miss uh, Miss Imon is a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, ma'am. Ma yeah, Miss yeah. yeah, and also yes. a Master Master in Public Health in Auckland University of Technology. So without further ado, maybe I would like to give time and space to, for Miss Imon to share about uh, the experience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I share the screen, or am I supposed to look at the screen? The comedy share. Oh, okay. Um, maybe you, uh, yeah, you can give comments. Oh, to our I cannot, right? I oh, yeah, don't have the you... right to, to share that. Okay, let me give you. Oh, yeah, I got it. 
Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm really impressed by the presentation of Margaret and it's a really great topic. And I'm also impressed by the participants action and questions. It's a really great topic. So I'm a, I, I am Iman. I just finished my Master of Public Health program at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. Uh, before that, I was a medical doctor. Uh, I studied my bachelor degree in Myanmar. I'm from Myanmar. I, I was supposed to go back to Myanmar after finishing my scholarship, but because of the complicated political situation in Myanmar, I couldn't go back right now. So I, I am literally stuck in New Zealand right now. So yeah, uh, so today in, in today's presentation, like Nechma asked me to do that, uh, I'm going to share my uh, scholarship experience and international student experience in New Zealand. Uh, this is a very light presentation. I think it's gonna take like five to seven minutes at most. So. Uh, before I, I've got New Zealand scholarship, I, I have applied uh, so many scholarship uh, across, uh, across the globe. Uh, I have uh, applied, I think, maybe more than 10 and nearly 15 scholarships from the UK, from Sweden, from Australia, from New Zealand, lots of scholarship. And this is the second time I applied for the New Zealand scholarship. In the second time, I got it. So I got the scholarship in 2018. I arrived in New Zealand uh, in 2019. So with the New Zealand scholarship, uh, it is available to, it works available to Pacific countries, Asian countries and African countries, all of the developing countries before 2021. But in the 2021, because of the COVID, uh, the scholars couldn't come to New Zealand and New Zealand scholarship could not provide uh, this opportunity to all of the developing countries. So in 2021, this New Zealand scholarship is not available for us, for us mean all of the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure about what will be in the 2022, uh, but if there is a chance, we can apply in 2022. So to, if you're interested to apply New Zealand scholarship, I'm sure that there are uh, lots of New Zealand scholar in Indonesia, so you can ask uh, them anytime you want. Uh, so basically, they, uh, the, the basic requirements of the New Zealand scholarship, they have only five uh, requirements. There is the age requirements, uh, which is uh, basically 18 to 40 years of age. And there is immigration and visa requirements. Uh, if you don't have uh, the past history of tuberculosis, you are good to go. And there is no much uh, uh, hassle around that. And uh, with the academy and English uh, requirements, uh, you, you, you have to uh, explore uh, something about your university first. If you meet the requirement of the university, you are good to go. And for the English requirement, you have to meet the two things. The first thing is you have to meet the scholarship uh, uh, English uh, requirement, English school requirement, which is the overall over score of six. So I asked overall school, school of six. And, and you also need to meet uh, the requirements of your university because in some university for some of the courses, you might probably need IELTS score 6.5. So it depends on both the, your, your university and also the scholarship. And, uh, and like I mentioned before, uh, we have to sign a contract with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Trade. Uh, we are obliged to go back to uh, our home country at least two years uh, for our country's development, which I couldn't do at the moment. So another requirement is uh, the work experience, uh, which is uh, one year of the full-time and two year of the part-time experiences. So this is basically the uh, minimum requirement of the New Zealand scholarship. If you think you met this kind of requirements, you are good to go to applying for the New Zealand scholarship. Uh, 
as far as I remember, a New Zealand scholarship is available for Southeast Asian country only for the master and PhD scholarship. But for the other Pacific countries, they are available for the bachelor degrees. So we are for the master and public, uh, PhD. So, and also they have the course, uh, the recommended course. For example, uh, in Myanmar, public health is one of the recommended course of, uh, in the New Zealand scholarship. Uh, and also the agriculture, the forestry, energy, and some of, the, some of those courses are the recommended as uh, courses for the scholarship. So if you apply one of the recommended courses, you, there, are, there, is a, there is a higher chance of getting the scholarship. Uh, so this is a few tips for you. So in New Zealand, uh, we, uh, we have uh, eight universities across the country. And the one I choose to study is Auckland University of Technology. Uh, uh, the reason I choose is uh, a little bit um, surprising because uh, in my country, uh, uh, people from the public health sector are, are quite obsessed with the University of Auckland courses. And I, well, when I applied for the scholarship, I was thinking about why don't we try other university, which is uh, 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 also teaching the public health. So I applied both University of Auckland and the Auckland University of Technology. I got accepted from both university, but I choose the Auckland University of Technology because this is the very first, I'm the very first student of public health from the uh, AUT. So uh, in studying AUT, uh, you might probably aware that from NACHMA, uh, we have the amazing scholarship teams, uh, which Margaret is part of the West part of the team. And uh, yeah, uh, she's a very great supporter for all of us. And there are also members of the scholarship team, uh, very kind, very supportive. And we do have the some extracurricular activities, like uh, for example, we have like, we have to meet the requirements for the AUTH award or AUT Beyond award. So these are the uh, award, uh, we have to do it for, of, uh, to complete our extracurricular activities. And also we have the exceptional student support. Uh, for example, like in the picture, you can see that there is a website called Studiosity, which you can check your assignments for, um, if, for example, like, uh, like your lecturers are very busy and they cannot give you a, a feedback for, for, for your assignments. Studiosity is one of the tool that, uh, that can help students to get feedback from the accredited, uh, 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 I think, uh, supporter from the website. So this is a very great uh, student support that AUT offer. And the Studiosity is not offered from the other university. I'm, I'm sure that you, the University of Auckland does not offer that uh, service, uh, AUT have it as well. So this is a picture I usually present to the fellow scholars. <laughs> Before I came to New Zealand, I was thinking like, uh, I'm, I'm going to study with a large group of people with the big lectures. But with the COVID and all loss of restriction, I couldn't able to do that. And when I'm studying in New Zealand, my friends and my families, my parents, they think like I'm enjoying the life of New Zealand very easily and without needing to study. But actually, it is not. <laughs> I have to do. I, I have. I, I'm facing a lot of challenges. I have. To to cook my food, and this is a great challenge for me. So, so that's a, a part of the joke. And for the Indonesian students in New Zealand, uh, I'm sure that all of the uh, people, all of the students from the developing countries, from the third world countries, we are facing the language barrier. And also there is a definitely the cultural barrier as well. So that is why we usually hang out with the people from the Southeast Asian countries because the culture is not, not quite so different. So, and, and also, but, uh, uh, but it is a great thing to hang out with the other uh, uh, students from the other, other uh, con continents because uh, we, can, we can share the diverse culture of the international student experience. And there is uh, also the homesickness challenge. And when we are, when we are getting ill, there is a great, great uh, upsetting for me and there is also time zone difference as well and by studying in New Zealand uh, I'm sure that we can get the independent lifestyle to take care of ourselves. 
So these are the challenges of the Indonesian students in New Zealand. So, but it, it is it, it definitely worth it. Uh, I, I got uh, completed my master of public health in October and I got a good grace and I'm now working at Auckland University of Technology uh, as a teaching assistant. So yeah, it, it, I, I would say it's worth it. So, yep. So this is the, the this is a quote I've been referring to during my academic journey. Um, sometimes we are lost and we don't know what to do. And this is a, a, also the wallpaper of my computer. I need to keep moving until I reach my goal. Thank you so much, everyone. I, I hope that it is helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eamon. It's uh, really helpful <laughs> and also full of new information related to scholarship in New Zealand and also about international student experience that we see that it is a beautiful life, but actually there are so many obstacles and also there are so many new experience and challenges that we need to face when we are being a student in, as an international student especially. Okay, maybe... Uh, uh, there has been lots of question. Uh, there, there has been a question uh, in the chat box from Zafira Estiara from Sriwijaya University. Thank you for the explanation, Miss Amon. I would like to ask some question. First, may I know the names of New Zealand scholarship program and where can I find that information? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for asking. Uh, the name of the New Zealand scholarship is uh, is changed. It, it is now Manaki New Zealand Scholarship. Uh, uh, it is. Um, uh, I'm going to share you the link to apply for that right. program. So it is. Um, you can uh, browse the countries, the program that you can apply for the scholarship. So I'm now searching for it. Thank you. Does it answer right. the question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Miss Avon, we would like to give um, another chance. Okay, from Fireza from Surabaya. Maybe I would like to give you space to ask directly to Miss Avon. Time is yours. How Fireza or? Teresa, do you want to ask something? Or another participant? Is there any question related to scholarship in New Zealand and also about um, international student experience? Okay. Oh yeah, I forget to ask Zafira. Is it, uh, is it clear? Or is there any question? Uh, okay, clear. Thank you. Okay. okay, Zafira. Another participant, is there any questions? Uh, Amon, most of our students are singles. And you know that it's difficult to far away with family. <laughs> Can you share your experience like to motivate the young woman to go far away from parents and to to gain the ambition how how, mm. how uh, you I, I i would say uh, the challenges um we have a lot of challenges with um uh the homesickness is a very very big one for us um, it is not very obvious when you are away for like one or one and one and a half year but when you are away for like three years like Najma uh, uh, doing a PhD far away from home, but Najma is very lucky. She has uh, her beautiful family in here. So uh, the challenges is we don't have, a, basically, we don't have anything, uh, a, a, we don't have anyone to share our difficulties, our challenges. So that is, that is why uh, we we have uh, that that is why the amazing scholarship team and the fellow scholars are very important for example in AUT uh, with the COVID because in COVID everyone is in at, at home we don't have to see anyone and uh, we are getting bored and we are stuck at home so that's very challenging but 
Uh, I don't see, um, I'm, maybe I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware the other university have the program like regular catch up within the scholars or with the scholarship officer and the students. But in AUT, we have the uh, month, uh, weekly meetings with the scholarship officer. We have shared our difficulties. We have shared our mental health challenges because, because depression is a very, very, very common in in and students who are far away from home so yeah it's it's very challenging so but it's really great to have the scholarship team with us thank you Najma. all right how bu Najma? thank you Amon. Another... inspire others mm -hmm. remember Jofi? you can go overseas yeah. and your <laughs> friends will trust you you can do the best I mean, Allah, I mean. <laughs> okay, so despite being ho being homesick, uh, we get new family there, right? Yeah, this yeah. One, yeah. Get new Actually, family. it is because uh, by the time you realize that uh, the scholarship team and the, and your friends became your family when you are away from home. Yeah, it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Look, all right. Um, I will give another chance. Okay, is there an English test that can be one of the language requirement besides IELTS? Yes, it is, and they can. Uh, they accept the uh, TOEFL skills and uh, all the other uh, English is, uh, requirements. I think, uh, but I'm not quite sure about that. I I, I will search it on the website and send it to you very soon. Uh, I, uh, I am aware that IELTS is accept, accepted and also the TOEFL schools are accepted and other, there are also other language uh, tests as well. And the, the New Zealand scholarship also accept that. All right. Okay. How Nashua, Nashua, is it clear? Uh, the answer, Ms. Amon? Yes, it's clear. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Because maybe because this is, uh, we don't have much time, Miss Amon, because, no uh, yeah, we already in the last sessions. Okay. But the last, maybe it would be very last. <laughs> oh, but all right. From Fiesa, you need education from New Zealand Education University of International Standard Academy from back of, oh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh okay. Oh, there, there, there is no more question. I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe that's uh maybe that would be the last question. So for everyone, you can check the link Thank from you. uh that 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 has been sent by uh Miss Amon in the in the chat box, uh, and the committee would help with would also help to send it uh, our group to our group. So yeah, maybe this is the end of our sharing sessions. Before we close the sharing session, we can take a documentations. We can take a photo and documentations committee. Operator. Okay. For, for all participants, you can open your camera. And also there has been a link of Attendance on the chat box. Okay. Yang teman-teman boleh isi link yang ada di chat box ya absensinya. Kalau nggak isi, soalnya tidak akan mendapatkan sertifikat. Dan untuk operator, kalau misalnya mau dokumentasi boleh dihitung ya. Dan teman-teman yang belum on cam boleh on cam. Silakan operator. Oke, kita mulai ya. First slide, one, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Next, one, two, three. Oke, the last slide. One, two, three. Oke, okay, thank you. Oke, okay. thank you operator. 
Well, that is the end of our agenda today. Thank you so much for our speaker, for for our speaker, Ma Margaret, and also Miss Amon. Thank you so much for the master of ceremony. Thank you so much also for the committee and also for all participants from all over the world, not only from Indonesia, but also from another country, for example, like Laos, Myanmar, and so on and so forth. And thank you for joining our agenda. Hopefully, our agenda today would be beneficial for all of us. Uh, there are so many insights, new knowledge, and also uh, we can meet each other uh, from all over the world. And and I'm uh, Jovita Kamelinda as, moder as moderator today. Uh, do apologize if there are some mistakes and faults during moderating this uh, agenda. And thank you so much for the opportunity. See you next time. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, moderator. To the audience, before we end of the event, uh, please feel attendance link in that has been sent in Zoom chat room. We wait until the end of this event because after that, there we will we will spin a further prize, which we will announce the on, on Instagram, Phil underscore Unisri. Um, I'm reminding you again. This attendance is a requirement for a certificate and door prize. So, please fill it out correctly. Kepada para audiens, dipersilakan untuk mengisi link absensi yang telah dikirimkan panitia di kolom chat. Saya ingatkan kembali, karena absensi ini syarat untuk mendapatkan sertifikat dan door prize, maka isi form uh, absen ini dengan sebenar-benarnya dan sebaik-baiknya. Well, this end is uh, the end of the event. I say thank you for our speaker today, our moderator, crew, and also thank you to the all audience. See you uh, on the next public health international guest lecture. To all audience, please leave the room. And for all crew, please stay in the room. All right. And also thank you, uh, Miss Graserva, for IKA, FKM UNSRI, Ikatan Keluarga Alumni FKM UNSRI, for sponsoring our agenda today. All right. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Terima kasih semua. Very great teamwork. Thank you, Jovida. Chris. Thank you, Bunda Zuma. Get well soon, Ibu. Get Thank well soon. Very much. Thank you Good very much. Community okay. boleh stay. Ya, komite boleh stay di room ya, kita evaluasi sebentar. Thank you, Jafira dan tim. Teman-teman panitia boleh Thank stay you. di room.